Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor, Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is just to eat meat and that's what you should do. But if uh, you're hiking or road tripping or stuck at work and you want something nutritious that is just meat, fat, and possibly salt, if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. I like this product not only because it is pure meat, but also because I really want the carnivore market to thrive as well. The more we support meat-only products, the more people will make meat-only products, and this will bring us into the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to check out, then take a look and use my discount code HTC to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks, guys. Hey, everyone. We're back with another episode of the How To Carnivore podcast and YouTube series. We've got Dr. Anthony Chafee with us again, the plant-free MD. Dr. Chafee, how's it going? Doing well, man. How are you? Very good. Thank you. You're looking very tanned and relaxed from your time in Southern WA. Yeah, it was, it was nice. So just out in the sun every day and um, actually had a, had a weekend off, which is rare. <laughs> First time in a while. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Um, so the topic for today is coffee, tea, and caffeine. Uh, and, you know, most people who jump in our carnivore challenge, they're very hesitant to give up the coffee. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's pretty obvious why. Um, but, you know, we've discovered that that last 5 or 10% makes a huge difference. Um, yeah. So wh- wh- why is it so important to remove coffee when you're, when you're doing carnivore? Well, I just think it's just, you know, one of the, one of the other things that are not as optimal and, um, and that you should think about, about removing. I mean, this, at the end of the day, this is sort of an elimination diet. You're eliminating out a lot of things that aren't adding benefit to your life or maybe detracting from your health. And I think coffee is, coffee is definitely one of them. It's a bean and a mm. bean is a seed. A seed is a plant's baby. And everything protects their babies more than anything. And so you'll generally find that in the beans and seeds, nuts, et cetera, that this is where you find the highest concentration of of different toxins. And so coffee is no exception. I think that's why you have that bitter taste is because there are chemicals in there. Your your brain is recognizing like, hey, this is is not good for you. That's why it gives that strong, bitter taste that you wouldn't naturally want to say like, oh, wow, that, that tastes great. You know, if you're just sort of picking around plants or something to eat in the wild and you're starving, you get that horrible, bitter taste, you know, you're not naturally going to gravitate towards that. And so I think that's a survival mechanism that we recognize harmful chemicals as, as tasting bad, that's giving a bad reaction. I think we should listen to that. And so coffee is in that category. It has that sort of harsh, bitter flavor. And I think that's because of these, these different chemicals in there. And, and there's <clears throat> a number of different things Besides caffeine, a lot of people will think that it's just the caffeine. Um, and so they'll drink decaf, which is fine, but you're, you know, there's 150,000 other chemicals in coffee as well. It's not just the caffeine. And in fact, I think it's probably better to do the other way around that if you're trying to come off coffee and, but you still like the caffeine, you're trying to get off that you can actually use, you can, or you can just stop altogether a, or you can use caffeine pills, which are much cheaper anyway you know like a bottle of 200 of those things costs as much as a cup of coffee does Mm, yeah so you can have that if you just want that caffeine kick and then you get the chemical that you want as opposed to the 150,000 others that come come with it and then you find you know that actually maybe you feel better without it i feel much better without it i have much better and more consistent energy throughout the day if i don't drink coffee or take caffeine I mean, if you feel better for those first few hours, I'm just buzzing off the wall and, and, um, and have a lot of energy and very productive. But after that, I feel pretty gross. I feel mm-hmm. like I'm coming off a drug and I am, you know? And so you sort of withdraw and feel just, just gross and, and you have worse energy throughout the day after that. So I find that it's, it's really not worth it to me to take something like that because it, it, it slows me down for the rest of the day. hundred mm, percent. What, what about tea? Are we putting it in the same category as coffee? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, depending on the tea and depending on how it's prepared, it may or may not be any better or worse than, than coffee, but there are going to be things in there uh, that the plant uses to defend itself with these defense chemicals and like caffeine. Caffeine is actually a neurotoxin and is developed uh, you know, in order to, as an insecticide to stop insects from eating it. And certain insects will eat this, the caffeine will kill them, yeah. you know? So, that's, that's what it's designed for. We, you know, have, have a bit of a different reaction to it. 
And so some people like that response, but it, it wasn't designed for us. It was designed a long, long time ago before people were around in order to, uh, you know, deter insects from eating it. So uh, that's the thing, you know, it's, it's not, these things aren't good for you. Um, there are studies that look and say, well, you know, if you have caffeine, you have coffee, people, you know, tend to do better for certain markers and outcomes and endpoints. But, you know, what are you comparing? You know, you're, you're comparing people that are, you know, eating, you know, standard sort of diet and maybe doing things in a standard sort of way. And then what are your endpoints? How are you judging success or failure and, and all these sorts of things? Um, and that could be, you know, maybe there are some, some advantages here and there, but I think for me, from my perspective, I simply just feel better when I don't have coffee or caffeine in my system. I feel more healthy. I feel like I have better, more consistent energy throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And I also do notice an increase in inflammation in my body when I drink coffee. And so, you know, I tell this story, but you know, when I was just coming back on the carnivore and I just wasn't, I couldn't get sore and I was like, okay, what, what's happening? So I, I put it to the test. I really tried to challenge myself and I just kept doing sets of squats and set after set after set. I ended up doing 32 sets of squats without being able to wear myself out. And I'm like, okay, all right, I'm just, I'll just call it here because I've been here for four hours and I've got things to do. And so the next day I was just like very scared. I was just like, oh my God, I'm, I, I'm probably gonna be crippled for the next month uh, from doing that. <laughs> Uh, that excessive amount of working out, but I wasn't, I wasn't sore. And th this really pisses people off to hear. I don't know why, but yeah. they, all the things this, this really bothers them. Bullshit. Yeah, you, you, you get sore. And I'm like, okay, I don't, but you know, like try it yourself. You, you'll see, you know, yeah. Those defensive chemicals, those inflammatory factors that exist in plants that actually cause that pain, swelling and, and inflammation stiffness. And because we've been eating this stuff our whole life, that's just normal for us. And that's just, that's just what we, we notice. And so we think, oh, that's, that's normal. You work out, you get sore. That's it. Well, no, actually that's not, that's not it, you know, because animals in the wild, they're running around escaping. If they're just oh, crippled and ugh, around the next day, well, they're getting eaten the next day, mm -hmm. gotten away once, but they're done now. And so that doesn't really work. You know, if you eat something that makes you feel like that, makes you feel bad, makes you feel stiff and uncomfortable and painful, you're not going to go back and eat that thing again, right? Unless you absolutely have to. So uh, we're just sort of trapped in that. We don't we don't realize what's happening. We don't realize that that's not normal. We don't realize that that doesn't have to be. So I saw that, and I saw that I wasn't sore, and I really overdid it, and I felt great. And so I was like, great, I'll go hiking. I went play rugby, and the next day still not sore. You know, and two days after that, normally you you peak in your inflammatory cycle um, for your, your delayed onset muscle soreness is 48 hours. And so this is now two days later, I'm not, I'm not feeling sore. I'm, I'm feeling great. I met a friend for coffee and I was like, okay, can I have coffee? What does this do to my body? I had one cup of black coffee and within 20 minutes, I could actually feel my body getting more and more stiff and more and more sore. My hamstrings <laughs> tightening up, my back started uh painful i'm like okay like like what's happening what's happening what's happening i could feel it building up in real time and then i was sore for the next two days you know not, nothing close to what i would have been if i was eating a normal diet i would have i would have been in trouble i don't think i would have been out of bed for a month if i if i was eating a normal diet because i've done things like that I've, I've overdone it in leg days not even half of what i did that day maybe a third and um well a little more than a third, but you know, I've done crazy heavy leg workouts and, and I've really overdone it. And I've just been absolute agony for two weeks, like actually two weeks. And I was just in so much pain. And so I was like really afraid that I was going to happen and it didn't, you know? Mm -hmm. So then, you know, I drink coffee and I'm sore again. I'm like, okay, well, that that's, that's not what I want to do. And that's not what I want to have. And I was working with a doctor here in Australia and he's an orthopedic surgeon. And so, uh, you know, we were, you know, we, we would work together and operate during the day and, um, we became friends and we started, you know, going to the gym together. I, you know, I went with him and I was just like, okay, well, you know, just go through and do my lifting schedule with me. And, uh, and so I was, I was like pushing him and he wasn't a guy that would really normally work out all that much. And so I, I was really challenging him 
he was like, well, you know, I'm operating tomorrow. So I really don't want to like really overdo it because I don't want to be sore. And I'm like, you're not going to be sore if you do carnivore, you know, like I'm telling you, you're not. And he's just like, he's really skeptical about that. I was like, look, just trust me. Like, it doesn't matter how hard you go today. Like we'll push you like really hard. You do my whole workout. Um, you won't be sore tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And so he was just like very, very, you just see him just sort of like looking at me like that's full of it. And, and he was just like, yeah, I'm really interested. I'm really interested to see if, if I'm actually you know sore or not tomorrow. And I was like, yeah, I'm really interested to see if you're, you know, how pure you are, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that's it. You know, if you're, if you're actually just eating meat and water, you won't be sore. You know, like I can, I can guarantee that. And so he's just like, okay, all right. And, and you're just meat and water. He's like, yeah, no, just meat and water. I'm like, you should be fine. So we get the next day, we're there in the morning and he's just like, and he's got this grin on his face, but he's just like, man, I wanted you to be wrong so bad. Like, I want to come in here and just be sore. I'm like, ah, oh, I told you I was sore this, that, and But he's like, but I'm not, I'm not sore. Like you were right. Like, that's crazy. That's so crazy mm-hmm. that I'm not sore. Halfway through the day, we're there. Everyone's sort of having lunch. I'm just you know, not eating anything. And, uh, and he's not eating anything, but one of the, one of the, you know, the, the, you know, medical equipment reps comes through and I got coffee for everyone and just pass around. I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. And uh, he had a coffee and I didn't say anything, uh, but he's there sort of drinking a coffee and he sort of gets halfway through. And after a while, he just sort of looks at me and goes, yeah, you know, I actually, you know, I am starting to feel sore. I actually yeah. am sore. And I just pointed out, I was like, what are you drinking? And he's like, ah, oh, damn it. That's it. it. And it, and it happens that quickly, you know, within minutes, you'll start feeling these effects in your body. And then when you start recognizing that you have that natural deterrence, you feel great all the time. You eat something that makes you feel bad. You're going to be naturally deterred. That's why people say like, wow, you must have so much willpower. just not eating it and stuff. Like, not really. Like I, I want nothing to do with that stuff because I know how it makes me feel. I've tried it, sample it back in. I'm like, yep, that makes me feel bad. I don't want to feel bad. I want to feel awesome all the time. And so it's, it's really not hard at all. It, it's, it, it's sort of self-reinforcing. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so some people will think you're crazy. And I think that's because, well, two reasons, because they haven't experienced that no pain, no inflammation of carnivore. So they mm-hmm. can't imagine what it would be like for that to be gone. But then also when you are carnivore and you, act, and you slip up, you notice it so much more. You know, yeah. like I'm, I'm the same. I can suddenly feel aches and pains in my knees or my back, and it's like, oh, where's that coming from? That's not <laughs> normally there. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I, I believe it. I've experienced it, but mm-hmm. I understand it can be, it can be hard for some people. I mean, it, athletes that hear this message, you know, particularly like you know, midway through the season, where you know, you, you would know at a rugby club, a lot of people can't run till Thursday. And they, mm-hmm. and they make it through a Thursday training and they're like, yeah, I'm good to go for Saturday. And then you just fire up for Saturday and you push through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, when I, before I was doing this, that was, that was it. And especially when I, I would drink on the weekends after games. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very big social part of it. I really enjoyed that. That was probably the sort of the seductive nature of it was, uh, you know, I had fun drinking as a Celebrating. Teenager. Yeah. It's yeah, a reason exactly. to drink and party. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and that's sort of why I chose rugby over fighting was because fighting was awesome. I absolutely loved it, but there wasn't that same social camaraderie. Like after the game, you'd go out and you'd have drinks and all that sort of stuff. And um, it was just, it was just business, you know, and, and people were friendly and, and I hung out and I was, I was, you know, uh, you know, good friends with everyone, even though they were like, you know, 10 years older than me at least. And, um, but it was, um, you know, it was that that social aspect and that atmosphere is just such a fun environment to be in. But at the same time, like you are you are working that off for the next like few days. It's not until like that Tuesday practice that you are that you are beginning to get all this stuff out of your system. I would always just you know like you, you would almost smell the alcohol coming out of your pores on the Tuesday, hundred yeah, percent. And uh, and you just like this. And that was it. You'd sweat the evil out of you. That's how I would, I would praise it. I'm like, oh, I got to sweat all this evil out of me. And then, you know, after the Tuesday practice, then you start feeling good a little better. And by Thursday, you start like, yeah, feeling better. And then, and then on the game, you'd be ready to go. And then you just destroy your life again. And so as soon as I stopped drinking, uh, that was different. I, I was feeling better the next day mm. and, you know, I could go run, I could do whatever. I was like, wow, this is amazing. My recoveries were so much, so much quicker. 
And I, that's because alcohol does, does a lot of damage to your body and the, the rest of the stuff does too. And so that was at the same time uh, that I sort of stopped eating all these plants and everything like that is when I, I uh, stopped drinking as well. And just sort of, I, I always attributed it to like just not drinking, which is a major part of it. But I never thought that the, that the, the just eating meat thing played such a big role. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. 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 And I, I know lots of people who've gotten healthier by cutting out alcohol, obviously. Mm. Um, and it's a good place to start, but you're right. Once, once you do that plus all meat, no plants, then it's yeah. a whole nother level. And like, you know, I'm looking forward to more athletes doing that during the season, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I've noticed too, that, you know, something slips in or something like a bit of carbs, or a bit of rice or a bit of beans or whatever, not even much. You know, my, my, my back will kill, like you were saying, like these aches and pains, like, well, that's not supposed to happen. Yeah. You know, the same thing. My, my back is like stabbing pain for mm. days after the last time I had rice. I'm not even, I didn't even have a, a, a single bite of rice. Right. It was just, it was at a restaurant and some of the rice and beans that were sort of stuck on me and I couldn't scrape all of it off because there were smaller pieces. And I'm like, yeah, oh, whatever. And let's see how, what this does to me. I regret that because it was like, it was four days of feeling like garbage. Mm. And, you know, so I really don't want that. Anymore. Oh, don't you miss rice? Absolutely not. No, I've never had rice that tasted better than, you know, than, than, than how miserable I was after having eaten rice. I mean, like, I don't want that pain. I don't mm. want 20 minutes to get out of bed, you know? And, uh, and, I, and I had to, when I was doing that, I don't know what the hell was going on but it was not fun. Now I have that, you know, I have aches and pains and things like that on a minor level, just because I've played a lot of sports and battered my body in a lot of ways. And that's just the nature of things, but it's perfectly fine. I don't, it doesn't limit me in any way. You know, I, I feel great all the time. Mm. It's just, you know, I'm 43 and I've got, uh, you know, uh, compressed discs and and arthritis in my kneecaps like man you got you got 77 to go yeah well i think so yeah at least i'm, I'm pushing 30 and if you know like people like you know david sinclair like you know actually get get going on this whole longevity thing we can actually start sort of reversing things i mean i think i'll be you know miles ahead of everybody mm -hmm. already yeah we'll see you know just just invest now yeah yeah this is your friend by the time you're 150, you know, you're going to be billionaire. So yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Let things compound. Yeah. yeah you should be exactly. the richest 150 year old going around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Dude, we should do an episode on David Sinclair and the um, the Lifespan book. I got some. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, but I've always yeah. seen his stuff. Um, um, I haven't seen too much of his stuff, but I, I know, I know he's working on this stuff. I've seen a couple of the, of the papers he's put out that they've, you know, making some pretty, pretty interesting breakthroughs. Yeah. He's, yeah. I think we should get yeah. into it. There's probably some David Sinclair fans watching this. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's, he's doing really, really interesting stuff, you know I mean? That's the thing too. You know I mean? He obviously doesn't, it's not a, not a carnivore sort of things, you know, like Lex Friedman is and, um, and yeah. you know, he, people like that. Um, uh, Sinclair and, and others on, but, um, you know, you, you don't have to get everything right all the time, you know, like the, these different sorts of people that have, that get thing, they get their luminaries in certain areas. That doesn't mean that they're right about absolutely everything. I'm not right about everything. I'm sure. And when I, I, you know, see, see that I, I try to, to adjust and change, you know, I'm not stuck in my ways. You know, certain things I'm like, no, I really think this is this is the way to go. And I say so. But if I find new information that really challenges that, I'll be like, I will change my mind. Like that is not yeah. that's the way it should be. I would you would hope so. Yeah. And so with David Sinclair, you know, I mean, he's just this isn't something that he's looked into in the same depth as other people have. And it's not something that he has, you know, necessarily seen the other side of the argument because you do have to look for this information. It's not just being presented to you. You know, his his colleagues at Harvard are very, very much pushing the plant based. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, they're like very that. woke so, at uh, at Harvard. Yeah, yeah. and and um, and you know, specifically the plant based stuff. You know, a lot of stuff. You know, I, I know a number of people that got their like their you know, masters in public health from Harvard and they, they went in one way and came out vegan, you know, because yeah. of what you get taught there, that is what gets pushed there. 
you know, and, um, and Harvard has this mentality of, um, because it's from Harvard, it has to be right. And so you'll notice that people that go there, it's just like, well, I went to Harvard. So that, that's not an argument, you know, um, you actually have to back it up. And, uh, you know, Thomas Sowell talks about that in his time there about how that, that was sort of the, the, uh, the attitude my grandparents met at Harvard and they said the exact same thing. And that's why like my, my family, um, we sort of didn't do that. We had a lot of, a lot of my family members, my, my grandparents met at Harvard, a lot of my, um, you know, my mom's family and cousins, they all went to Harvard and my parents were just like, you guys aren't going to Harvard or the Ivy league schools, you know, because they didn't, they didn't want that. They didn't want these sort of programming pushed down our throats. They wanted us to be taught how to think, not what to think, you know, That's brilliant. and so that was, that was very important to them. So they didn't want us doing that. I think, I, I think I would have been fine, you know, a bit more stubborn than, than some people, but yeah, I uh, think they would have struggled to brainwash you with the plant-based stuff. I would hope not. You know, I'm, I'm sort of interested in doing like an MPH. I've, I've gotten emails from them about doing like an MPH, like master of public health there. And, um, you know, they have a very good program, obviously, you know, but um, I would, I would, I would wonder a, if they'd let me in knowing, you know, my background and, uh, you sure. know, no, no. and, uh, but B like, you know, you know, how, how these, how these classes would go, because obviously there would be some, some in-depth discussions, you know, during class time that would sort of take over the, the yes, le- guest lecturer, Dr. Anthony Jaffe. Yeah. In the class. Yeah. <laughs> the truth about nutrition. That'd be brilliant. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, I think, it, I think it would be fine though. And, um, but yeah, so, you know, Dave Sinclair, like he's seen what he's seen and and he sort of made the decisions that way, but, you know, he's looked into, you know, a- anti-aging and things like that Yeah, way more than almost anyone else has. So he, he is an expert yeah. and, you know, yeah. sometimes when you're an expert in something, you forget that you're not, that, that it took you 20 years to become that. And, uh, and then you sort of look at something else and go, oh, well, this is what the evidence shows. So that's what it is. And like, well, maybe, you know, but you know, you wouldn't accept that from someone else coming into your field and just, and just saying that, you know, because they heard a couple of things and it's like, well, this is what it is. And you're like, well, actually it's not, you know, because you know more about that and people forget that, you know, like it, it's uh, someone pointed this out a while ago when you're reading a newspaper and you're just reading stories, you're reading columns, you're like, wow, this is interesting. Wow. Look at this. Oh, look at that. And then you come across something that's in your field and it's just like, that's bullshit. Yeah. yeah that's not because of this, this, and this. And then you go to the next one, like, wow, that's really interesting. <laughs> Forgetting that they just messed that one up. You know, what else have they messed up? You know, maybe they got the other ones wrong. Maybe it was just a one-off, but you know, you don't know. I mean, people do the best that they can. You know, not everything's a, a conspiracy or an agenda, but there, there are conspiracies and agendas out there, especially with nutrition and food. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. People can just get things wrong. You know, they can, they can, you know, mean well and have all of the data and support and things and, and come to something, you know, it's uh, Thomas Sowell said, you know, it, it is perfectly reasonable, you know, and, and understandable for two people to look at the same piece of information and intelligently and honestly come to different conclusions. You know, that's, I think is that's the, the best definition of being open-minded is accepting that fact. You know, that just because someone disagrees with you on something does not mean that they have ill intent. You know, it just means they disagree. You know, like, well, I disagree with people on nutrition because I've looked at things differently. I've seen other points of information. And when I relay those points of information to people, even vegans, vegetarians who are doctors, nurses, and nutritionists, they they tend to come around. You know, I, I, I have yet to have someone who has been willing to engage in a conversation with me um, and go back and forth, even aggressively, that they have not come around um, and seen seen the light. But you know that's okay. So I see this information, and I have a different different take on it because I have a different background on it. You know, and other people do as well. But it's not because they're a bad person and they're and they're trying to be you know misleading you know bastard. And I'm not either. You know, but that, people forget that mm-hmm. as, as well. It says you know now people can't accept that people can be in error they think they're in sin it's not that you know you've made this mistake but you are a bad person because you think that you know like that's a very very dangerous road to go down 100 mm, percent. yeah i really want you to read lifespan 
and uh, and kind of decode it. So I tried to read it and coming from somebody who's done a lot of research into carnivore, mm -hmm. I found that a lot of the sort of medication or supplements that he was recommending like resveratrol was to yeah. mitigate the effects of eating plants and carbohydrates. So it would be yeah. like, you, it would be like you have a meal and your insulin spikes, insulin causes <sighs> damage and like, you know, and can shorten your <laughs> lifespan. I'm like, yes. And then he goes, then you take this sort of like some, you know, and, and even um, he recommends uh, like met, metformin or whatever it's called, mm. the stuff that diabetics take. And he says, and then you can mitigate the inflammatory effects of eating the food and you can lower your insulin level. And I'm just like, okay, cool. Just don't eat them. Yeah. And well, I'm sort of flicking through, try to find more. I'm like, so, so where does he get to the good stuff? Yeah. That's so, funny. You know, so what, what, what he's saying works, but... Mm. Uh, what, what about the cause you know well right yeah i mean you're 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 treating a symptom not the disease right you know that's what it seems like to me but i need, yeah. need you to read it well but i mean but in that you know that sort of uh description you know that sounds like what's happening he's saying that you know insulin is bad and these things are bad so you take these medications well like you know like gundry is this it's like you know plant paradox it's like you know you know, lectins are bad, you know, they're really bad for you. So take this medication that can, you know, uh, uh, mitigate lectins. Exactly. Yeah. Like stop eating plants. You know? So he comes from a background of like, Hey, you should eat plants, but they're bad for you. So you have to take these other steps like, or just don't eat them. You know, you don't have to, you don't need them. And you guys have said clearly that these things are causing harm. You're eating carbohydrates, your insulin goes up. That's a problem. You know, you should take this medication or just don't eat the carbohydrates. Very simple, you know, skip the middleman. And so, so that's the thing, like that, that's what, sort of what I wonder is, is, uh, I think, I think a lot of these, these youthful aging sort of techniques are going to pale in comparison to just eating properly, just eating what we're biologically designed to eat. Yeah, and, correct. you know, I think that you'll live 120, 130 years just doing that. And then, so, you know, that's where you start. You start off with proper nutrition. You start off with, with eating a biologically appropriate diet. And then you try to find things that, that help you from there. But yeah, from the sounds of it, you know, these medications are really just helping with, mitigate the effects of eating something we're not supposed to. And so, uh, but I'm sure that there are other things. Yeah, well. exactly right. That, that's just things that can, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's, but like, yeah, there's some things that he was talking about, like in mice that are actually like can can actually like reverse their age and things like that in certain ways. So if we can if we can figure that out, you know, I mean, like you, know, you have telomeres on your on your chromosomes, you know, have these little little molecule caps, and you have you, you sort of cleave these things off, and once you run out of that, that cell line dies. And so that's, that's how you can sort of tell how long you're going to live and your metabolic age based on your, your telomeres and other things. And so, you know, exercise, you know, like, like weightlifting, you know, that can increase your telomeres, you know, having growth hormone that can increase it. Um, you know, but like all these different sorts of things can, can increase your telomeres. So that, that's like, Oh, that's, that's sort of reversing the aging process and things like that. And so maybe there are going to be more and more things, you know, like, cancer cells, they cap their telomeres. So they, they never run out. They, they can just, they can just go and go and go and go and go. Right. Lobsters have capped telomeres. So they don't, they just don't die of old age. Their tissues don't break down like that. Like ours would, they just go, you know, and if they don't get killed or don't die of something, they don't just die of old age. That's the idea. And so that might be interesting, figuring out how to cap our telomeres. And then you just immortalize your cells. Mm -hmm. um, but that could cause other problems, I'm sure, you know, like horrible cancers probably, you know? So, you know, because like some cells you need turnover, right? Your skin cells, your epithelial cells, things like that. So what would happen then? You sort of immortalize these things, you know? Um, you know, is that still going to have the same turnover? Is that still going to have the same, uh, you know, properties that they had before? But, um, you know, I'll leave that to, to them to figure out. I, you know, I'll stick, I'll stay in my lane, you know, because I I just don't know about that stuff, but I think it's interesting. And I think you start with the biologically appropriate diet and get your body working as well as it can naturally, and then try to mess with it after that. Yeah, hundred percent. Just uh, flicking back to caffeine, I think, well, speaking from, from my experience, when I w went to give up coffee, which I did in uh, April, May last year, a fear of mine was that my performance would drop 
so I was like, I was like, oh, well, I, I, I work better when I have caffeine and like, you know, I can train better when I, when I have some caffeine and like, you know, you see like, you know, a lot of really smart people, you know, they're slamming coffee all day and athletes are taking caffeine pills and all sorts of stuff. That was a fear of mine. Look, I've discovered that it was an unwarranted fear. Um, but do you want to sort of do you want to expand on why that may or may not be a, a fair thing to fear? Well, I mean, you're, you're used to getting that pickup when you take caffeine and so you yeah. feel charged and, and other times you, and you feel, and then you come down like, Oh, I'm not on caffeine. I feel bad. Um, but that goes away. You know, like you get, you get through the hangover period and you get through the withdrawal period and then you get more consistent energy throughout the day. And because your biochemistry is better and you're able to mobilize your fat stores and make ketones, blood sugar, and glycogen at, at on demand, then you, you have energy on demand. And so the, the more you work, the more you push yourself, the more energy you're going to produce and burn. And we feel better when we burn more energy. That's why things like coffee and stimulants make us feel better because we're, we're burning more energy and we feel great. And, um, and so when you just start working out and exercising, pushing yourself on a carnivore diet or in a ketogenic metabolism, you start mobilizing more energy and you feel better. So, you know, because you're burning more energy and that makes you want to work harder, which makes you burn more energy, which makes you feel better, which makes you want to work harder. And so it's this positive feedback loop. And so you find that people just, just feel really great and they want to do more. They want to do more because they get that, that good feeling. And so that's why, you know, I like working out for several hours. I don't, it's not that like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I feel better for having had worked out. No, no, I feel better while I'm working out. I feel better right then. I don't want to stop because I feel so good as I'm working out. And so you'll find that your energy levels, especially as an athlete are much better when you're on a carnivore diet or even just a keto diet, high fat meat based keto diet. And it's, you know, some people will take caffeine or they'll take pre-workout sort of stuff to get that spike of energy so they can go in and work out hard. I go to the gym to get that spike, mm. you know, go to the gym. I start working out and I start producing more energy and I feel better, you know? So if I want more energy, I start doing more you know, and I feel better, you know? And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that inspires me to push myself and work mm -hmm. hard, feel better as I'm doing it. The more energy you produce, the better you feel. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's and then, well, the more energy you burn, right. If you're just burning all this energy, you're sitting there steaming with energy and you just, you just feel, feel like you're full of life. You can take, you can take medications and drugs to do that, you know, and, and people do, but you know, you, if you're in a ketogenic metabolism on a carnivore diet, which you, you should be, you know, you shouldn't be eating a bunch of carbs and sugar, um, then you're going to feel like that. I mean, people can take carbs and sugar and then they have all this energy and they, they go do something, but you don't, you don't need that. If you, if you start working out, then you'll, you'll get that naturally and you won't run out, you won't crash, right? And you won't hit the wall. So, you know, if you're burning more energy, you feel better, you know, people just do. And that's why they chase those sorts of sorts of things. And so, you know, um, that's why, you know, I feel better when I'm working out, you know, when you're eating a bunch of carbohydrates, like, yeah, you know, if you're, if you're on a, if you haven't eaten a bunch of sugar and carbs or whatever to have that higher blood sugar to carbo load up, to carb up, you know, like, you know, this is, this is why the classic, you know, uh, police officers and, and donuts, right. Because they're working night shifts, they're doing shift work, they're feeling like crap, they're drinking coffee, they're just trying to keep their energy up because they're, you know, just switching back and forth from day, night, evening, morning, all that sort of stuff. And they just feel like crap. And they're like, okay, we need to get, we need to get some energy. So they'll, they'll eat a bunch of donuts, which has carbs and sugar and they feel better. And they drink some coffee. Like, Great. I feel good. I can, I can attack my shift now, you know, and, um, you know, and, and, you know, do my job. And so that's, that's the rabbit hole people go down is they have to eat those things in order to feel good, to do their job or to work out. But you don't need to do that when you're not eating carbohydrates. You know, you just start working out and you just feel better as you go. Yeah, love it. Burn more energy, feel better, and burn your own energy and, mm -hmm. and run on ketones 100%. Yeah. It's a good way, to, good way to live as well. Stop trying to, you know, preserve yourself and trying to sort of rest all the time and start mm -hmm. doing stuff. You'll feel better. Yeah, you do feel better. And you just, you know, you just get out and be active. 
move your body, do things outside, you know, get some sunlight, you know, you know lift things, put them back down. You know, it's great, you know, but it, it doesn't have to be lifting weights. It doesn't have to be athletics, but, you know, you know, join a team, join a sport, join a something, you know, yeah, it's a yeah. good in, yeah, environment as well. And it gets you out there. It gets you doing things and gets you uh, experiencing life. And, you know, you know, people think that it's like, well, I don't really have time to, I don't have the energy or whatever. You'll find that if you make the time to work out, that you'll actually have more energy throughout the day. You'll be more productive. Otherwise your brain actually works better. It changes the, you know, the, the chemistry in your brain uh, in, in such a way that your brain actually works more efficiently. If you're, if you're exercising, you know, the ancient Greeks knew this, it was this, this scholar athlete sort of model that they yeah. tried to recreate with the Rhodes scholarship at Oxford. That was for people that don't know the Rhodes scholarship would sort of give two of these things a year to different countries to sort of each country. That's a, that's a, a member and uh, they get this for the top scholar athlete at your in your country. So just give two of them for each country. Uh, America gets more because it's just bigger. So we get sort of like different regions split up. Um, you know, my grandfather was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, and awesome. Things it was it was like you had to be a scholar athlete. So um, a lot of it they really focus on the scholar part, and they sort of you know just sort of fudge the athlete side of things if yeah. they have if they really want you from your academic point of view, but you have to do something. You yeah. have to do some sort of sport. So my, my grandfather uh, was on the rowing team for, for uh, Oxford. Yeah. Sick. Um, and so he ended up doing another degree there and doing his PhD there. And, um, and he rode for Oxford while he was there. So that was it. That was, that was the idea. And, uh, and it does actually benefit you physiologically to exercise and, and work out it actually helps your brain as well. So it's, it's, um, there's a, there's a significant advantage to doing these sorts of things together. Mm. Yeah. On, on that point, the, uh, the sort of modern, um, perception of like, you know, you've got to be really scrawny or overweight and hopeless physically to be smart. And then if you're really physically dominant, you got to be dumb. That's bullshit. <laughs> and yeah, they definitely, course. you know, they both work hand in hand, physical exercise, mm -hmm. discovering your body, learning how to use it, and then also using your brain and, and developing. So that's yeah. well, your brain moves your body, right? And yeah. so your brain actually is in control of that. And you have your spinal reflexes and muscle and things like that. You know, it's just just as like a you know, like a pianist, you know, they're not thinking like on this note and this note and this note and this note. You know, they're hitting 50 notes, you know, every three seconds, you know? Yeah. And because they're just for the, you know for like a concert pianist and so that's not you can't consciously think about that that is muscle memory you've trained your body to move in a, in a specific way and that's the same with athletics you know you are you are training yourself to you know to run jump kick uh and and then move in a certain dynamic way and in fact they can actually take a lot more uh you know intelligence in a lot of ways because you know, when you're, when you're playing the piano that you, you're freestyling and, and doing those sorts of things, you're, you're playing a set thing. You've practiced that piece. It can be extraordinarily difficult to do these sorts of things. And it is um, not taking that away from anybody. Um, but you're not, you're not doing that while 300 pound guys trying to kill you, you know? So like you have to, if you're on the, if you're on the field, you have to react to what other people are doing too. It's not just you. You know, it's not like golf where you're just trying to, to hit a ball in a certain area. And even then that changes up. You're on this angle of this slope and this sun's in your eyes and this is how far you got to go. It changes what you're doing. But, you know, when, when someone's competing directly against you and you have to react to those other people, you know, it, it takes it takes a lot. You, know, so you have to be very, very well trained. And that is your brain doing it, your brain, and your spine, your nervous system training you to react in different ways, in, in different situations physically in a split second decision, you know? So it's, uh, it does take, it does take a significant amount of intelligence and it does go hand in hand. And, and the thing is, is that people focus generally are quite myopic. They focus on something. So if you're yeah. in sports, you focus on sports. If you're in to you know, certain academic field, you focus on that, that field. And so we can just sort of get, you know, trapped in that. And, you know, obviously if you focus a lot of time onto something, you're going to get better at it, you know? Musicians need to practice their instrument. They need to spend hours a day doing that. Professional athletes need to train for their sport hours a day. You want to be an academic. You need to study hours a day. It's, 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 all, it's all about work. It's all about hard work. And a lot of people aren't able to put in that same amount of work in multiple different disciplines. 
but it does actually help. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Working on both at the same time or multiple things at the same time, you know, yeah. you're yeah. working well, the same it, sort it, of yeah. discipline. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and they can, they can complement each other, you know? And so you're moving your body, you're working out and that makes your brain work better. I, I came across that actually at research when I was studying for my MCAS going to medical school. And so I was still playing rugby, you know, because I just, that made me happy to do. And, um, but I was studying for the MCAS. I was, I was spending, you know, a long time, you know, like when I was getting like really leading up to the test, I was studying for like, you know, 12, 13 hours a day, every day and, uh, getting ready for this exam, but I would play rugby as well, you know, and, uh, and I would train and I would go to the gym, you know, for half an hour, 45 minutes every day. I just, I would just get it done. And I found that it definitely helped me. Uh, with my concentration otherwise and help with my energy, my mental energy, um, not getting as much mental fatigue and, uh, and, and just, you know, ended up benefiting me academically, not just physically. hundred mm, percent. All right. Thanks Dr. Chafee. Let's, let's wrap there. That was awesome. Um, until next time. That was good, buddy. See you then.